Thank you for downloading this program from the BBC. And now Edward Sturton presents this edition of Profile. I have never dealt drugs and never been involved in taking or dealing cocaine. This whole case was a horrific and disgusting entrapment by Mazir Mahmood and the Sun on Sunday newspaper. That was Tulisa, the singer-songwriter and sometime X Factor star, speaking after her trial on drugs charges collapsed earlier this week. The judge said there were strong grounds for believing that the main prosecution witness, the investigative journalist Maza Mahmood, had lied to him. And the Crown Prosecution Service is now re-examining 30 criminal convictions in which Mr Mahmood was involved. It's the climax of a story that has all the best ingredients of a Shakespearean tragedy. Ambition, greed, crowned heads, hidden sins. Fergie sells Andy for £500,000. Posh kidnap. We stop the crime of the century. Sven's dirty deal. Dirty bomb foiled by news of the world. Caught. Match fixer pockets 150 k as he rigs the England test at Lord's. Those are just a few of the scoops which have made Mr Mahmood, the fake shake as he's often known, a journalistic legend. But is he perhaps not so much a Woodward or a Bernstein but more an Othello or a Macbeth, a hero with the gifts for greatness, but fatally flawed. He's ruthless, but plenty of journalists are ruthless. He's devious, but plenty of journalists are devious. But I think the refusal to ever admit uh, that he's in the wrong is what gets him into trouble. And I think if you look at the Tulisa Conto Stavlos case, uh, then you're looking again at his determination to prove he was right. And that's what got him into trouble by attempting to manipulate a witness to ensure that his side of the story was told. In the best traditions of the tragic hero, Mazam Mahmood's destiny seemed written in the stars. He was born to Pakistani immigrants in Birmingham in 1963, one of two brothers. And at home when he was growing up, journalism was almost literally meat and drink. The media commentator Roy Greenslade knows both Mazar Mahmood and his brother Wazim. Very enterprising father who started an Urdu language newspaper in Birmingham. Mazar actually told me this himself about how they used to sit at the kitchen table and staple all the newspapers together. But according to Wazim, Mazar was often his own man. He marched to the sound of his own drum. I was trying to break into journalism as a 16-year-old and got turned down two years in a row for work experience, unpaid work experience on my local newspaper. This BBC interview in 2008 is the only one Mazam Mahmood has ever given. Some family friends came round one night and they were chatting over dinner about video piracy. One of the guys was talking about how he was stealing uh, films from a cinema and producing them on videotape. And I thought, hey, that's a great story. So I just picked up the phone and rang the News of the World. Next thing I knew, as a 16-year-old, I was down in London working for the News of the World. A remarkable and indeed precocious start to his career in adult journalism. But as Roy Greenslade tells the story, it also brought an abrupt end to harmony at home. The family were really split apart, unsurprisingly, by the fact that this enterprising young man had decided that he got a story rather too close to home. Some of his family relationships remain difficult. Wazim Mahmood is also a journalist but the two brothers haven't spoken for 25 years. In 1985, at 22, Mazar got his first staff job on the Sunday Times, one of the big beasts in those days of what people still called Fleet Street. Roy Greenslade was his boss and was in charge when Mazar Mahmood got something wrong in one of his stories. I was managing editor news at the Sunday Times and inherited Mazar Mahmood as one of my reporters. He liked to be a self-starter who got his own stories, and I found those stories were not really Sunday Times' agenda. So there was a, a frisson between us over that. But then he made a silly error in some copy and um, unfortunately decided to indulge in a cover-up and blame the news agency. And when we checked with the news agency, we found that it was he that was wrong. And then he went to the extraordinary length of going into the main computer room and attempting to change the hard disk. He was found out, and naturally enough, I recommended that he be dismissed, but he resigned. 
That incident came back to haunt Mr Mahmood years later, when he appeared before the Leveson inquiry on press standards. He was grilled by the inquiry counsel, Sir Robert Jay. Tampering with the computer file in order to pass the mistake from yourself to the Devon News Agency was wrong, wasn't it? Absolutely. I was a young reporter um, and I'd had a series of run-ins with Mr Greenslade uh, while at the paper. And, you know, I made a mistake, you know, I acknowledge that. And rather than incur the wrath of, of an executive who I didn't get on with, I foolishly you know, thought the best way would be to cover my, my mistake. It was a wrong thing to do, and I resigned. That inauspicious start with the Murdoch papers didn't stop the news of the world offering Maza Mahmood a new home. He joined the staff there in 1991 and stayed until the paper closed three years ago. Paul Canoe is now a media consultant and commentator. At that stage, he was an enthusiastic ambitious young investigative reporter who specialised very much in what you might term traditional investigative journalism, exposing um, Peter Phil Rings, bent police officers, corrupt public officials. He was rather sceptical about celebrity journalism, which at that stage was an integral part of the paper, but perhaps not as much as it became in later years. Traditional in his targets, but also in his methods? traditional in his targets and in his methodology. Also at that stage, although he was originating some of his own stories, we were also assigning him to stuff. He was, at that stage, he wasn't, if you like, the celebrity journalist in, in his own right or in the way that he was promoted as he became in later years. Were you impressed? I was fairly impressed. Occasionally he was over-enthusiastic, but in those days I can't recall any stories that raised serious problems, either legally or ethically. Paul Canoe was one of Mazar Mahmood's bosses when the journalist started using disguises to get his stories. Most famously, dressing up in an Arab headdress and flowing robes, surrounding himself with the sort of entourage that suited his assumed princely status, and spending the paper's money that way too. And as his journalistic methods became more elaborate, his targets changed as well. One of those taken in by the fake shake routine was Kieran Fallon, six times winner of the title British Champion Jockey. He was invited to dinner at the poshest of posh hotels and encouraged to be indiscreet about, among other things, the Queen. Basically, as he said, he wanted to invest in bloodstock, he wanted to buy some horses, he wanted to get involved in racing. From the first meeting with him to the last, you know, it was all about, you know, being bugged and trying to get me to say things, you know, for the, the royal family. The, the Queen wouldn't have an idea about her, her bloodstock, which... I know that she's very knowledgeable. You know, and that didn't work for them. Then they started on about black jockeys, you know, they were trying to say there are not many black jockeys that can't ride, you know. Trying to get me to you know me to be racist against black jockeys or that was their intent. And then of course when they couldn't get anything on me like that, they hit me with this uh, they were fixing racing. The Dorchester dinner was followed by a trip to Marbella in Spain, where Maza Mahmoud tried to persuade Kieran Fallon to admit to throwing races and threatened to publish a story accusing him of using prostitutes if he didn't play along. That was another thing they were trying to do as well. Every time we went to a nightclub, we were bringing girls over. I said, no interest. He said, if you admit to stopping horses, he said, we won't run this story about all the stuff that you've been telling about the royal family and black jockeys, and, you know, you, you don't know what to do or what to say. You know it's not true, but you think these guys, you know, the power of the pen... They can do what they want. It's the start of my nightmare. You know, it was the start of, of, of me and getting divorced. Kieran Fallon later went on trial for fixing races, but the judge ruled he had no case to answer. At the Leveson inquiry, Mazar Mahmood claimed to have been responsible for 250 criminal convictions. The figure was later revised down to 94 by his employers. And there were sometimes signs that even when his stories did lead to a conviction, judges and juries weren't entirely comfortable with his methods. Roy Greenslade has followed his career closely ever since the two of them had that run-in at the Sunday Times. Towards the end of the 90s, there were two cases, an actor called John Alford and a gentleman called the Earl of Hardwick. These two cases aroused my attention especially because both made similar complaints about the disproportionate use of a lure, of, of a promise to them, in order to persuade them to buy drugs on his behalf. Both complained that they were plied with drink, 
both said that what they were being offered was almost too good to turn down and that that's why they were persuaded to break the law. Both of them went as court cases. I felt sympathetic towards them. And in the Earl of Hardwick's case, I noted that the jury actually recommended to the judge, we find the man guilty, he certainly did it, but we plead for mercy. We think that he underwent, and I use the exact phrase the jury used, extreme provocation. The judge agreed and gave him a suspended sentence, which was very unusual at the time, given that he was supposedly selling Class A drugs. With the phone hacking scandal at the News of the World and the Leveson inquiry that followed it, journalism of the fake Sheikh school was put under the spotlight. An uncomfortable place for someone like Mazar Mahmoud, because, of course, his disguise depended on keeping his appearance secret. The cameras were switched off for his evidence at Leveson, but the Inquiry Council pursued the allegation of entrapment with some vigour. Where is the ethical line, in your view, about the the size of the carrot? Well, as as I've said to you repeatedly, that no matter what the size of the carrot, you cannot entrap people into committing these crimes. However, the public perception is that because they've offered a huge carrot, that that has resulted in the crime taking place. It's going to be a minimum of 150,000. Take it for the bracket. That's just for your trust. Mm. That's for me to pay my six boys, mm. yeah, right, a certain amount each. Right? And to say that, we'll that was the then Pakistani cricket captain's agent caught on tape as he negotiated terms for spot fixing matches. And this thing was very successful indeed. Paul Canoe. I'm a long-standing judge of the British Press Awards and, you know, I was one of those who decided to give him the award in 2011 for what I regarded and still regard as an outstanding piece of public interest journalism, the expose of the Pakistan cricket spot-fixing scandal, which, of course, led to three test cricketers and a bookmaker going to prison. The spot-fixing scoop was only three years ago and even now some of Mazar Mahmood's critics within the journalistic world speak of him with a grudging respect. Roy Greenslade. It is fair to say that when properly directed towards a public interest story, say whether it's about human traffickers or pimps uh, or, or possibly people arranging fake marriages and so on, he was very good. And he did have signal successes and was responsible for a lot of people being arrested and eventually going to jail. Not quite as many as he's boasted, but certainly a great number. Some of his victims, perhaps unsurprisingly, are less generous. I asked Kieran Fallon how he found Mazar Mahmoud as a person. I don't think he's a person. You know, knowing what he's doing is wrong, and he destroys a person's life with a whole family. When I was arrested about race fixing, the first thing the detective took out when he arrested me was the news of the world and turned in front of me. It would be a mistake to underestimate Mazar Mahmoud's ability to bounce back. After all, Roy Greenslade never expected him to recover from his departure from the Sunday Times. But it's possible that the final act in this drama may be written by someone in robes topped off by a wig and not Arab headdress. After the Tralisa trial, the police will be considering whether Mahmoud should face any criminal charges. I think he began to believe in his own mythology, and this led to, I think, to corners being cut chances being taken, and I think probably was the road to to Lisa and what I suspect will be the end of his career and could very well lead him to facing a criminal trial for perjury and or attempting to pervert the course of justice. And of course, if he's in the dock there, he won't be afforded the luxury of the fake shake disguise. That edition of Profile was presented by Edward Sturton. The producer was Smita Patel. There are many more news and current affairs programmes to download for free from the Radio 4 website at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.